Welcome back, fellow adventurers, to Swords and Wizardry 101. I am Professor Ben, your host, guide, and dungeon master here uh, through the madness that is Frog God Games. Now, today, we are going over special combat rules in Swords and Wizardry. Um, Swords and Wizardry um, is an old-school game system um, that is uh, created and crafted to reflect, uh, like I said, old-school uh, RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons, specifically um, uh, the Zero Edition Dungeons and Dragons, the little brown box that it used to come in. Uh, so this PDF that we're looking at right now is free for download on Frog God Games website. Just click the click clink, click the top link in the description to go ahead and download that. Um, the hardcover is uh, you know at cost. Um, however, if you want the PDF, it's absolutely free. So why not download it and uh, go along uh, with me as I dive through this series? Uh, if you are joining in now, uh, this should be video 11, I believe. So there's 10 other videos that if you want to watch, you can. Or uh, they are perfectly titled, and um, the title uh, also reflects the thumbnail. So if you need to find a video that you're specifically interested in, you can go to that playlist, um, which is also in the description. So it's that easy for you to follow along on the series. Now... Like I said, we're talking about special combat rules today. This is going to follow mass combat, which is basically like war. Uh, if, you, if you are playing a war campaign, which is uh, similar to like war gaming, um, how you run that, you know, if there's two armies clashing into each other, we're obviously not going to roll individually for each person in the army. It's going to take you know, it's going to take you a year to do one battle, uh, and it's too tedious. Uh, then we have siege combat, which is like siege warfare with war machines, catapults, trebuchets, like all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's aerial combat, um, and then there's uh, ship combat, which is basically like naval, you know, naval battles. Uh, I, I want to say, if you're new to the game, these are rare. I personally rarely have ever had any of these come up. And usually it's like how I've done it in the past. It's just kind of whatever we think up at the table is the best. You know, the thing I do like about swords and wizardry though, is that it has all of this specifically detailed out because a lot of game systems that you're going to play for RPGs don't have all this stuff listed out for you. Um, and if, if you, it does, it's all in different spots. This is all consolidated into a couple pages for you to read. Now, well, as you know, I in the beginning of this series, I wanted to have longer videos, and I've drifted towards shorter ones recently, just giving you sort of like what you need to go play, um, and that's what I'm going to do with these. Um, you know, I could spend 45 minutes each talking about these, but I just don't know if that's completely necessary, and I don't know if anyone specifically wants to hear me talk about mass combat for 45 minutes. Um, so if, if there are any pieces of this that you have questions, please let them, uh, put them in the comments and I will answer them there. Or if there's enough comments about one specific portion of the special combat, I'd be more than happy to make a longer video or a fuller video, um, talking about the, uh, specifics, the nitty gritty, the number crunching of these combats. But for the sake of sanity, we're going to go over sort of bare bones versions of these here today. So no more, no more blabbering on. I'm going to go ahead and get a sip of coffee out of my Hoth mug. Uh, as you can see, I got planet Hoth here. Um, and then we have a little bit of a scene of, of when Luke is messing it up, um, <laughs> messing up the invasion. And then it's like uh, in Spider-Man Civil War or uh, Captain America Civil War when Spider-Man takes down Ant-Man from swinging around his legs. Uh, it's like he's taken down an AT-AT -AT or an ATST. All right, cool. Or an at at. People say at at. I say AT-AT. -AT. So anyway, um, we are starting in um, mass combat. Now, uh, real quick about outdoor rules in shooting things because everyone knows we like to shoot things. If you're shooting a bow... Indoors, you'd normally say have 70 feet worth of distance to shoot, right? Uh, however, outside, convert feet into yards. So you can shoot uh, 70 yards in outdoor combat in a maximum range of 140 yards at a minus two to hit. So basically, if you can only shoot, like I said, 70 yards indoor or 70 feet indoors, switch it to yards when you're outside because you can angle um, the trajectory. I'm sure there's physics that's involved in that. I'm simply a gamer and a writer, uh, and a video maker. So I don't know physics, <laughs> but just trust uh, in the process. So that's a little thing I wanted to get out of the way, convert feet to yards. You got a lot more space to work with. Um, and also do that for the monsters as well. That's the important thing that we need to remember when we're going through all of this. This is not only for the players to keep in mind, but it is for the monsters to keep in mind because 
generally if monsters are having this sort of combat with the PCs, they're probably intelligent beings. So make sure to uh, optimize these and utilize these to your advantage as well to give the players uh, the utmost challenge possible. So mass combat. Like I said, imagine it's two armies going at it. Um, you know, there's a there's a, a wizard and his forces going against uh, army of goblins. I think is the example in here. Um, yeah, Garfinkel the wizard um, at the Battle of Azure Wood. Um, and so basically, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take uh, and you're kind of kind of you're gonna play it a little bit like a war game, like old school D and D originally comes from war games, um, and you're going to set up troops or units um, of five to ten monsters or NPCs or, you know, whoever the PCs are fighting. And these five to ten units are going to have a combined health pool and they're going to have a combined attack as well. Okay, so just do it all together. Clump them. If you have a bigger army, say there's an army of like 20,000 undead or 20,000, you know, 20,000. I don't know how gnolls would organize that well, but let's just say gnolls or orcs. Um, you know, maybe put them in like groups of like, a hundred or 20, you know, whatever, whatever you need to do for it to make sense in your head, uh, sort of set up if they're organized and they have, you know, specific, um, ways that they set up their forces or if they're just randomly clumped on a battlefield, all that is up to you, but make sure instead of, instead of, like I said, rolling individually for these, uh, monsters, we're going to roll them in groups in groups of five, 10, 20, 50, a hundred, whatever you want to do and whatever makes the most sense for you. So when they take damage, which they will, um, say, you know, say the players, um, shoot an arrow or shoot arrows. Um, th basically the players are going to be commanding their own army as well. So it, it's not like the players are shooting fireballs into the crowd, which they could. Um, but more than, more than likely, these are going to be high level players who are commanding a, uh, battalion of archers to shoot into this army of the undead. Um, or goblins we'll use for this example. So when they command that army to shoot into the goblins, say they hit, uh, they're going to they're gonna hit depending on the troops to hit. Uh, so say they have like a, they just roll their d20 and they have a plus one to hit. You're going to roll against the goblins AC. Now the goblins AC is just what the goblins individual AC would be because it's a group of them. So let's say, you know, we'll use ascending. We'll say they have like a 12 AC. So we need to roll like an 11 to hit. Say we hit. Well, you do some damage. Uh, you're going to be rolling a d6 to see a morale check of what happens when uh, they are inflicted with damage. Um, also, remember to keep in idea and keep in your head that if the if they are immune to any sort of damage, that carries over in this mass combat as well. So, if you're fighting a group of werewolves, you know you got to hit them with something silvered or magical to even do damage. So, we're going to do a morale check when we get hit. Uh, four out of uh, uh, if you roll a one, four out of five soldiers are dead in the unit, and the unit is removed from the board. The one or two uh, extra survivors fleeing away. When you roll a two, the unit has no casualties, but is forced back uh, on its move, and the attackers can move up. Uh, so basically, um, they're broken, and I'll explain that in a second. Number three, uh, they remain in place and they're broken, so they don't have to retreat. Four to six is the unit remains in combat normally. Um, if the unit loses all of its hit points, all the soldiers in the unit are dead. So, uh, say they roll like max damage and just absolutely nail every arrow, the unit's going to die. But if you don't kill them with your attack, your first attack, do that morale check. Now a broken unit, um, is basically just a confused unit, um, that is in this middle of this warfare that scatters kind of, you know, they're freaking out a little bit, um, as we can see down here, regular troops, not mercenaries, have a 75% chance to rally. So you roll your D100 or your percentile dice, and then if you get um, if you get that number, then you're good. Um, Well-trained mercenaries have a 50% chance to rally, and militia have a 25% chance to rally. So like a normal D100 roll, for example, if you are rolling for a elite group of troops um, or experienced, you know, regular troops, you have to roll a 75 or lower, which gives you better odds. And then as you go down, the odds slowly shrink and the piece of the pie, you know, thins out. Um, an important thing to know as well, um, you can break up moving and attacking. It's up to you. If you want to do it more simple and just have them move and attack at the same time, that's fine. Uh, but normal as normal rule initiative as if you're going into a dungeon, um, and, and say the goblins win initiative, they can move forward and attack or just have them move forward, then have the PCs 
move their forces, then have the goblins attack, then have the PCs attack. Whoever wins initiative gets to decide who attacks first. And so, for example, if the goblins don't want to attack first, if they want to see if the PCs are going to do anything weird and then they can counter it or flank it maybe, then you can let the PCs go first and vice versa. So whoever wins initiative gets to decide. There are some tactical things that can come into play. However, uh, I personally usually just remember um, or uh, recommend attacking first and uh how i see it <laughs> is uh they can't deal damage if they're dead so <laughs> uh that's pretty much it from the mass combat the siege combat is very simple as well the siege combat is going to work into um oh and there's some modifiers here uh, for you as well to go over if you would like so the um these are our the siege the siege equipment are basically just going to be used in the mass combat um I don't generally use them um, because they're kind of comp. They can get complicated, but there's ladders, there's undermining wa a wall, um, there's siege towers, battering rams. There's all this kind of stuff. If you want to really expand your mass combat to be as realistic as possible, then it's all here for you. And if you want to create your own thing that is is similar, um, there's plenty of inspiration here to go off of um, and and change it up. So. Next up is aerial combat. I'll take a sip of my Hoth coffee. Ben's hair is going wild because of quarantine. It's crazy. Uh, by the way, I did see the comments. Uh, I'm going to keep the webcam on for the rest of this series. I think it's better. Uh, it gives a face to the disembodied voice. So um, aerial combat can be kind of difficult. Now, aerial combat can be between these monsters or it can be you riding these monsters. So you could be on a giant eagle, uh, a griffin, a hippogriff. Uh, you could be on top of a flying carpet, on top of a dragon, um, or on a, a flying ship like a warship um, that is propelled by some sort of engineering if your world has engineering. Um, and you can be doing combat on this, uh, on these as well. Um, so the important thing here is movement. You're going to be moving on hex grids. Um, and this is your maximum um, course alterations per round. So if basically how I think about this, this, this can be, get a little complicated because it's a mobility issue. Um, basically, um, bigger objects can't turn as easily. That's how I have always remembered it. And that's how I, I, I remember actually having a conversation with some of the guys who worked for TSR back in the day about this. Um, and they were upset that newer editions didn't have something like this where you can't maneuver as easily. So like, for example, a dragon can't do a 180 turn and just turn, you know, like there's no way that that big of a beast can stop its momentum just, or not even stop it, but like move it that quickly. Whereas something like a large bird would have an easier time swooping around. If you're a big dragon or a flying carpet or a flying ship, especially, you're going to be taking a long time to go around a movement. So um, as, as, as well as here, you have the minimum spaces between alterations. So like to alter your movement, you have to move six spaces as a flying ship. So you're going to have to take a wide arc around to turn. You know, it's kind of like the same thing with ships, like sh big vessels, um, you know, like think like Pirates of the Caribbean kind of ship when I'm talking about this right now. Um, those things like na naval ships can't just turn really easily. You know, they take a wide bow out and it's the same thing with aerial combat. So just keep, that's the most important thing that I want to teach you in this video to keep that in mind. Like I said, there's plenty of things that go into this as well. Um, how to hit in, in aerial combat. Um, you roll your die uh, and if it, these are critical hits here. So if you get a crit, um, the rider must retreat, uh, head, wing, body, um, you get half speed or you fall and crash. So if you get a critical hit, um, make sure to roll on this table and whatever you get and to whatever you're attacking, make sure to keep this in mind as well. Um, and, and actually here's a table for you. Uh, if you don't want to just determine the hit location by yourself, you can just roll for it randomly. Um, and if any of these, like I said, if any of these are a critical hit, um, then you're going to go on this table here and talk about and, and figure out what's going to happen. Um, and these all have, of course, descriptions laid out for you. So, you know, fallen crashes and ambiguous fallen crashes, just as it sounds, incur uh, 1d6 hit points of damage per increment of altitude, which is 10 yards fallen, which if you're doing aerial combat, 
that's a lot of damage <laughs> and it's gonna be not very good now ship combat like i said it, it's it's sort of like the other ones combined uh except there's some ramming and and grappling and boarding that kind of goes on with this as well so the another thing to keep into mind about ship combat is you're going to roll a 2d6 and determine the wind speed um if if you are a a DM who doesn't like rolling for everything, just decide it yourself. Um, generally, just to keep it a little bit more simple, maybe say it's light or strong wind, a gale force wind is going to mess up the entire combat in many ways. But if you have players who are very strong, maybe you gave them too many magic items or something, maybe throw a gale force wind and see how they can handle it. Uh, the galleys, um, for combat, uh, you can ram. Um, the ram ship has a 25% chance of being breached in the hull. If breached, it will sink in 3d6 turns. Um, so also maybe like, you know, compare movements for this. You have your, your rowing uh, speeds down here. So like if you're, if you have a large ship or uh, trying to ram a galley, the large ship with momentum is probably going to mess up the galley really badly. So just keep in mind, like what you're ramming into what, um, you may grapple a ship, um, you may board a ship as well. Um, there's all these sort of explanations for the kinds of ships and what exactly you can do in combat, of course. Um, and as you can see, a large galley is 40,000 gold, which is a lot of gold, uh, opposed to a shipping boat uh, or a, a fishing boat shipping. I say shipping because I reading ships right now but i also just packaged up 200 uh boxes that i had to ship out and uh, shipping has been in my head all day so it's ironic we're, we're talking about ships um <laughs> so those ship types um uh, the, it, it literally everything you need if you are really like crunching numbers and being exact and precise are here for you in these tables so your rowing speed if you gain a bonus for the wind directly behind you indirectly behind you directly ahead of you indirectly ahead hexes between course adjustments so that's the swivels that i was talking about earlier i keep using a different word yeah like the swivels like how you're able to turn um this this also gives you the crew of what you get if you have a large galley as opposed to a small you know it's about half of the party that you would have the uh, armaments so the catapults um, at the bow and stern or one light catapult structural points how much damage it can take and such and the cost so literally everything is here even special catapult fires for or special catapults for um, firing on ships so there's a nice little image of a ship as well so that looks like some gale force winds into some rough tides uh so that is going to be a tough combat because you're going to definitely have penalties from that oh that gave it a little blue overlay that kind of looked cool huh okay well i think that's going to pretty much wrap it up for today i know i went through a lot of this fast but like i said this is generally just better off done in a simple way um unless you are building up your entire campaign to have a huge mass combat, then yes, of course, get in the nitty gritty. But if it's just a side quest or just another part of the campaign, I would just recommend keeping it simple. And the nice part about Swords and Wizardry is it keeps it simple for you and has everything in here for you. As like I said, I would like to go ev over every number and every table, but like I said, we're gonna be here for hours if we do that um, because of the detail that is put into this, which is amazing. Uh, personally, I, I made a video way back saying what old school rules I take into my new school games, and this is one of them. This is absolutely one of them. Swords and Wizardry is one of the best books that I have found for special combat. Um, and of course, I take it and put it in my own game. Um, fifth edition, as far as I know, doesn't have the the you, dragons can 180 thing. Um, maybe I'm wrong on that, but you know, even if you don't use this, just use it for inspiration in, in your smaller combats um, on how you can do things a little bit more efficiently so you're not sitting there for forever uh, rolling dice and determining movements. So that's it, guys. Uh, next up is Monsters. Uh, monsters is going to be super fun. Um, I'm going to go over uh, monsters, where they, where they are, how to use them, how they are created, their armor class, their hit dice, their attacks, their saving, th all of it. I'm going to go over all of it. And I'm going to go over some of my favorite monsters, how to create a layer for a monster. Uh, it's going to be a fun a fun uh, session of Swords and Wizardry 101, and it's completely dedicated to monsters, whereas a lot of these sessions um, have multiple things, like we just had four 
categories today. Um, so thank you so much for watching. Subscribe for more content like this video. If you enjoyed it any time, leave a message in the comment section down below if you have any questions or if you have a fun experience with mass combat. I'd love to hear them because I love reading these stories. They're really fun to me. Um, that's it. Be good. Stay safe. Be kind to each other. And uh, yeah, keep going on. Adventure's worth winning.